Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Barry Colfer, and I am the Director of Research here at the Institute of International and European Affairs in Dublin. A very warm welcome to this event on the post-legislative elections in France, what happened and what happens next. In this IIA panel discussion, our contributors uh, will review and dissect the recent French legislative elections and will reflect on their implications. Our two experts will discuss voting trends, electoral issues, the results and possible new government, the extent to which it is possible to discuss this, and what this may mean for France's domestic and international policy. But of course, France is very important. It's important for us, important for Europe, our closest EU, our closest EU neighbour, as we often remind ourselves, and our friends in France. And of course, at this time of great tumult globally, looking at news very recently with President Biden stepping out of the race yesterday, it makes political developments in France and across Europe feel even more urgent for this mainly Irish audience. So I'm really delighted to be joined by our two experts on this subject. We have Dr. Elodie Fabre, who is a lecturer in politics and international studies at Queen's University Belfast. We're also joined by Mathieu Gallard, who's the research director at Ipsos France. Very broadly, Mathieu is going to speak to us first and he will present some data and trends so he's going to be our first speaker. And this will be followed by LOD, who, of course, reflect on these trends also, but we'll try and look behind them and speak a little bit about the politics uh, before, of course, we hand over to you, our audience. I'm going to briefly introduce uh, two speakers and thank them uh, before handing over. But just to get the quick reminder of housekeeping, the usual terms apply. This discussion is on the record. To participate, you, our audience, please use the Q&A function as usual that you'll see in front of you on your screens. Please include any affiliation if you have one when asking a question. And you can also, of course, participate in the, in the discussion on Twitter X, if you're so inclined, using the handle at IIEA. So the first person you're going to speak, you're going to hear from in a moment is Mathieu Gallar. He's been research director at Ipsos France since 2016. Mathieu is in charge of surveys on political and electoral issues in France and abroad and has produced analyses on these matters for numerous media and think tanks. Before joining Ipsos, uh, Mathieu worked at the French Government Information Service, which analyzes public opinion for the Prime Minister's office. After Mathieu, I'm delighted I'll be able to hand over to Dr. Elodie Fabre. Elodie is a lecturer in politics and international studies at Queen's up in Belfast. Elodie's research focuses on political parties in France and in the UK. Elodie is currently working on the evolution of, of Renaissance, Emmanuel Macron's political party, and party finance in Northern Ireland, two extremely interesting and important topics. Without further ado, colleagues, you have 10 minutes each, and I'm going to hand over to Mathieu first. Now, Mathieu is going to be fiddling with the screen for a moment just to put his uh, slides up. So if you may bear with, and I'll hand over to you then, Mathieu, whenever you're ready to go. Thank you very much, Barry. I think it's okay, but... Looks yeah. great. It's in... Uh, okay. It's still in the... Yeah, there you go. Perfect. Okay, perfect. Let's go. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for the presentation. I will try to try to give you an overview of what happened during this uh, very very interesting uh, election month in France. But I think uh, before talking about the parliamentary election, we need to go back to uh, the uh, and it doesn't work. Yeah, to the European election, uh, which uh, took place on the. 9th of June, if I remember correctly. It's a long time ago now. A lot, a lot happened uh, since then. Uh, but of course, it was a, a very interesting and very important uh, starting point in order to explain what happened during the parliamentary election. So first, of course, uh, during this uh, European election, we first uh, had a, a national rally, so the, the, the far-right party recording a very, very strong result with 31.4% uh, of the votes, which was uh, an all-time high for the for the party. Uh, and as you can see uh, on the graph, which uh, displays the results of the party for each election since its creation, uh, European elections were actually very important for the party because uh, in the first the first time the the, the national rally. Uh, was called the National Front uh, before, before in the past, across the ten percent mark. It was in the European election in uh, nineteen eighty four with ten point nine percent. 
The first time the nation already crossed the 20% mark, it was also in a European election in 2014. Uh, and the first time it crossed the 30% mark, it was this time still in an EU election. So EU elections are very, very important uh, for this party. And we had another evidence of that uh, last month. And what was very important also uh, is that uh, the, the, the geographic dominance of the party was clearly displayed uh, on this map. Uh, first, uh, on the on the left, you have the, the map of the of the vote uh, in the in all the legislative constituencies uh, of the of the country, and you can see that. Well, basically, you don't have much difference compared to to what we what we had in the pay, in the past. Uh, basically, uh, where the party was strong twenty years, thirty years ago, is still strong today. Uh, it's on the Mediterranean coast, so on the south uh, south east of France, and on the north east of France uh, is quite weak uh, still today. Uh, in the large uh, agglomerations, so for example, Paris, Lyon, uh, Bordeaux, Toulouse, Strasbourg, but also on the west of France, especially in Brittany, in the Loire Valley, in Normandy. But what was very important was that for the first time, the party uh, arrived in first position in the vast majority of the constituencies. Actually, we have uh, 577 constituencies in France, and the National Rally, uh, uh, National Rally arrived in uh, first position in 457 constituencies. So you can see that on the on the other on the other map, and of course, uh, it was very very impressive. Mm -hmm. Another uh, very important aspect of the EU election was that it was just a disaster for Emmanuel Macron's coalition. Uh, it, its party, Renaissance, got only 14.6% of the votes, which is uh, really, really catastrophic uh, for, for, for its party. And on this, uh, on this graph, you have the results uh, of the parties supporting the government uh, in all the EU elections. And you can see how bad uh, this result, this 14.6% uh, is. So... Uh, of course, uh, because of the of the strength of the national rally and of the weakness of the presidential coalition, uh, it immediately raised the question uh, about why Emmanuel Macron decided to call for a snap election uh, after this uh, this result. And the, the, of course, I'm not Emmanuel Macron. I, I don't know what was in his, in his mind, but. We can imagine that uh, the rationale behind it was just the fact that the left-wing parties were highly divided in the EU election. Uh, you can see that the, the Socialist Party uh, came in first position among the left-wing party in the EU election with almost 14% of the votes, but France Insoumise, the far-left party, uh, almost got uh, 10%. The Green Party was a little bit higher than 5%, and the Communist Party, uh, with only 2.4%, was was still uh, a rather important, uh, rather important uh, formation. So. So the, the fact that the left was totally divided was, of course, very important, uh, quite probably in Emmanuel in Emmanuel Macron's decision to to dissolve the National Assembly, because, and uh, we will discuss this a little bit later. Uh, basically, because of the voting system in in French parliamentary election, if you go divided, uh, you will be totally decimated uh, in the first round and not present in many constituencies in the second round. So quite probably it just showed that with the left, uh, uh, left wing parties divided, uh, they would not have enough time to make a coalition uh, which will enable uh, its, its party to, to qualify against the nation already in many constituencies and to benefit from a Republican front against the nation already in the second round. But as we have seen, this is not exactly uh, as uh, things went during the parliamentary election. And this is where we are now. If we if we look at what happened during the first round, no, first, sorry, uh, we need to discuss, of course, uh, the, the main uh, element explaining the result of the, of the first round. Which is, as I said, uh, things uh, didn't uh, didn't went uh, as Emmanuel Macron anticipated. 
and the left actually very, very quickly decided to make a coalition. So the four main left-wing parties, the Socialists, the Green, the Communists, and the France Insoumise uh, decided to make a coalition, and it changed everything because as you as you can see the left uh, the total of the left wing lists in the eu election make for 30 32.6% of the votes again on against only 14.6% for emmanuel macron's party uh, which means that uh, with our voting system uh, the, the left was in a considerably stronger position than emmanuel macron's coalition and this was very important of course uh, uh, an important aspect of the first round is the very simple fact that people, French people, were very, very highly mobilized. This, has, this was the uh, strongest turnout since the 97 election, uh, as you can see on this graph. And another very important point is that uh, the turnout was uh, evenly, uh, evenly distributed among the voters. Uh, it means that contrary to the EU election, where far-right voters were especially highly mobilized, uh, it was not true uh, in the parliamentary election. Uh, actually, left-wing voters, centrist voters, and far-right voters all were highly mobilized and with no really uh, different in t differences in terms of turnout. So it was an important aspect. Another important aspect of course was uh, the, the results, uh, with results which were in a way quite different from what happened in the uh, in the EU election. So first you had the the result of the of the national rally and its allies, 33.3% uh, of the votes, which was of course a good result. We cannot deny it. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, it was quite less that uh, the total result of the of the far right during the EU election, because you also had Reconquête, which is a, a party which is on the right of the nation already, uh, which, which was quite strong during the EU election with more than 5% of the votes, this time only 0.7%. And also the nation already uh, managed actually to split the traditional right, Les Républicains, and it didn't really benefit them uh, in terms of votes, as we can see here. So it's, of course, a very good result for the National Rally from an historical point of view, but not such a good result in order uh, to try to, to get uh, an absolute majority as the party was aiming for. Uh, for the left, it was also a, quite a good result because 28.5% uh, uh, in the first round it means that the vast majority of the left-wing voters actually voted for this alliance, the New Popular Front, the Nouveau Front Populaire, which was a, a very strong success for the left because during this, uh, this very short campaign, many pundits uh, talked about the fact that it was a, an alliance between totally different parties and that the voters would not back this alliance. Actually, they backed it, but the fact is, uh, it was a, 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 an, a, an effective alliance in order to, to uh, make uh, all, basically all left-wing voting, voters voting for, for it, but not very effective in order, in order to attract new voters from the centers, from the center of voters uh, abstaining in, uh, in other elections. And for the centrist uh, coalition ensemble, so the, the coalition supporting Emmanuel Macron, 20 one percent it's definitely better than what they get in the eu election so it was a, a good result for them compared to very recent elections but of course uh, from again from an historical point of view it's not a very very good result for the for ensemble on emmanuel macron's so every every party every coalition can in a way be happy with the results of the first round but on the other hand nothing no one can be very very satisfied by it and we can see uh, on the map of the coalition arriving in first position in all the constituencies that the map was totally different from what we had in the eu election with the left and also uh, the Macronist coalition arriving in first position in actually a significant number of uh, constituencies. What happened uh, just after the result of the first round arrived is that the Republican Front actually made a comeback. So what is the Republican Front? Front It's just the tendency of the parties and of the voters to try to block the national rally to come to power. Uh, it means that the party 
uh, withdraw the candidates when there is a three-way contest. Uh, so if there is a three-way contest, the party arriving in third position uh, withdraw its candidates. And it means at the voters uh, level that the voters tend to tend to try to block the national rally. Uh, it was the Republican Front um, uh, something that many many analysts uh, thought was vanishing in France because it didn't uh, it did not work very well on at least uh, actually it didn't work at all during the last uh, parliamentary election two 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 years ago. But now uh, the situation was. Of course, totally different because for the first time it was something really possible that the national rally would govern the, the country after the election. So it had an impact. It had an impact on the parties and many, many parties uh, on the left, but also uh, on the Macronist coalition decided to withdraw their candidate arriving in third position. And you can see it uh, in this uh, in this quite complicated slide, but the, the, ma the main aspect is that you can see that the, the number of three-way contests was uh, 300 and, uh, 306 three-way contests after the results of the first round. But actually, uh, we had only 80, uh, 80, 89 third-way contests because uh, many candidates from the left and from the and from the Macronist coalition decided to withdraw, and we had many more two-way contests than uh, that we anticipated. And of course, it was not a very good news at all for the national rally because the national rally benefit uh, from running against uh, divided oppositions than, than more than uh, running against uh, a single uh, a single candidate. Uh, and here you have the map of the. Of the configuration in the in the second round, with a vast majority of two-way contests. This is uh, in purple, and with still a few uh, three-way contests in uh, in uh, orange, especially uh, in uh, in large agglomerations uh, around Paris, especially, and in the west and south and center of France, where the national rally is quite weak and had no real chance to win uh, the constituencies. And the, 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 what, what was really surprising, of course, was what happened in the, in the second round. First, the turnout in the second round was still very strong. And it was a very important evidence during the election day that the Republican Front was in place at the party level, but also at the voters level, because it just meant that many left-wing voters, when they faced in their own constituency, uh, uh, a Macronist versus national rally contest, they actually decided to vote. And it was exactly the same for uh, Macronist voters when they faced in their own constituency a two-way contest between the left and the far right. So it was very important uh, that uh, voters stay mobilized in order to have uh, a strong uh, Republican front. And this is what happened. And on the voters' level, we had it... Uh, we had this uh, re Republican front uh, surging again after a very weak uh, showing two years ago. So I, I don't want to I don't want to talk about all the data here, but this is uh, the results of the of a survey we have done during election day, and basically it shows that uh, in the two way contests between uh, ensemble candidates, so a candidate supporting Emmanuel Macron on a national rally candidate. 72% uh, uh, of the left-wing voters from the first round decided to back uh, the ensemble candidate, which is very, very strong. So uh, uh, among left-wing voters, the Republican front was really, really strong. And on the other side of the slide, you have uh, what happened, especially for Macronist voters, what they decided to do when they when they were in a situation where uh, they, in their constituencies, there was a left-wing candidate against uh, a national rally candidate. If the left-wing candidate was a moderate one, a socialist one, a green one, or even a communist one, uh, a majority of them, 54% uh, voted for the left-wing candidate, only, only uh, 15 voted for the national rally candidate. But even uh, if the, uh, the left-wing candidate was a radical one, one from La France Insoumise, 43% of the Macronist candidate uh, voted for the left-wing candidate against 
only 19% uh, voting for the so far right. So, of course, the Republican Front was not as strong uh, among centrist voters compared to uh, left-wing voters, but it was strong, uh, it was strong anyway. And explain uh, why we have this uh, configuration in the in the new assembly. So a new popular front, the left-wing coalition, with a, 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 a plurality of seats, a very weak one, but a plurality anyway, uh, a Macronist coalition with uh, 166 seats, which was uh, a very, very good result compared to what we could have expected uh, when Emmanuel Macron uh, called for the snap election on the national rally uh, with 140, uh, on its allies with 142 seats, which is, of course, a strong improvement compared to the uh, 89 seats uh, won in the last election, but which is also very, very, very far from the expectation because uh, this uh, Republican front surge uh, between the two rounds of the parliamentary election. And now I let the floor to Elodie, who will, who will explain to you uh, what we can expect from <laughs> this new assembly, and it's not going to be easy. Thank you so much, Mathieu. Just before handing to you, Elodie, there's just maybe two little things I want to ask about your presentation, Mathieu, if you'll indulge me. Yeah. Uh, one one is a question on uh, of data, and another one is a question on process. Just in terms of data, do we know what happened to the Heconquet vote between June and July? I mean, it's a remarkable drop from, it was 5%, I think, in the European elections to 07 or something. Did those supporters just drift to the other parties of the right, or, or can you say what may have happened? They, they definitely went to the national rally. Uh, what we have seen is that uh, inside the Reconquête, so the, the party on the right of the national rally, there was uh, a very, very confusing situation between the between the European election and the first round of the parliamentary election. And actually, uh, one of the main figures of the party uh, is Marion Maréchal. Uh, she is a niece of Marine Le Pen. Okay. She uh, decided to go to the national rally to reconquête, and actually, she decided to back uh, the, the national rally. So most of uh, the, the party voters decided to to vote for the national rally candidates. Interesting. Okay, and then my question about process is: myself, many people on this call are just very interested in elections and their mechanics and how they how they differ and how they're similar. You drew a lot on turnout. Turnout was obviously relatively high. Is there anything that explains that beyond the very obvious? And you can say no, if it's just because this election was very important and people were more felt the urgency, perhaps that, or was there something driving it or something organized to try and improve turnout? And kind of similarly, uh, something that was really fascinating was this Republican front. You, you, you dwelt on this very clearly in your presentation where there was the three ways that many candidates stepped out so as to avoid splitting the 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 non-right-wing vote, let's call it. Similarly, did that emerge kind of organically or were there any figures in French politics within the parties that were particularly important in bringing about what seems to have been a very kind of successful move for the parties of the non-right? Okay, uh, regarding the, the turnout, I think, uh, well, basically you, you said it, uh, voters just felt that uh, for the first time since a long time, there was a lot at stake in this parliamentary election. You know, since 2002, each parliamentary election in France uh, is organized just after a presidential election. And many voters just think about this kind of election as a confirmation election, which is uh, which means that basically the new president will have a majority. So there is not a lot at stake. For the first time uh, since uh, 20 more than more than 25 years, uh, the election was organized uh, in the middle of the presidential terms, and of course uh, there was a lot of at stakes. First, uh, which party will govern uh, the country after the election, and even more importantly, uh, it, will the national rally be in a position to govern the party after the election? It was, of course, something that mobilized a, a lot, uh, very strongly, actually, national rally voters, but it was also something that mobilized voters who were, who were uh, afraid of the perspective of the national rally governing the country. So it explained why uh, the, the turnout rise uh, in a similar proportion among every every categories of the population, basically. 
Uh, regarding the, the, the Republican Front, uh, uh, it's something that is organized. You can, well, th theoretically, you can have uh, you can have a Republican Front without party organizing organizing it, but it's really really difficult to imagine. So you mm. need to have uh, candidates uh, or parties in third position withdrawing the can the candidates, and this is something that happened very very quickly and very very clearly on the left. It was the dynamic was clearly more difficult uh, among the Macronist coalition, with, for example, uh, some leaders, uh, for example, Edouard Philippe, the former prime minister, uh, saying that yeah, they accept uh, to withdraw their candidates, but not uh, when uh, the candidate opposing the National Front uh, is a far left candidate. Some other were a little bit uh, more clear, even if it took a few days. For example, Gabriel Attal, the prime minister, actually, he decided to say clearly that even if the candidate, the left wing candidate, is a is a far left candidate, uh, the the party needed to to withdraw uh, the candidate in this case. So uh, it needs to 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 happen on the on the party levels. And I think uh, yeah, the message of the leaders was very important uh, in order to make it happen on the voters level. But it's true that it was a little bit surprising how strong it was, especially uh, on the among left wing voters, uh, if you consider. Uh, all the, the tensions, and this is not the the the, the, the accurate world uh, between the the left and the and the presidential coalition in the last two years. Very clear, Mathieu. Thank you very much. Uh, Dee, I'm delighted to hand you the floor. By all means, please make your presentation. But if you have any comments or thoughts on what Mathieu has shared with us as well, please uh, please fire ahead. Thank you, Aladi. Okay, thank you. Well, while I'm presenting, I would also say add that on the Republican front. Left voters have actually more of a track record of it. They're more used to voting for uh, candidates uh, they may not support in order to prevent the election of a national rally candidate. They've done that as far back as 2002 when Jacques Chirac uh, ended up uh, against uh, Jean-Marie Le Pen in the presidential elections. And again, every time uh, Marine Le Pen has been uh, uh, in the second round of presidential elections, it was against either a right-wing candidate or um, indeed against Emmanuel Macron. So they've, they've got a lot more practice of voting for someone from the other side than um, Emmanuel Macron's voters or some of them and voters uh, on the right who have not had to do this sort of electoral gymnastic. Uh, okay, so... I'm going sort of to follow up uh, on what Mathieu was uh, saying. Uh, and so we kind of had the same starting point here, which was, um, are you also seeing the the closed captions? The closed captions, yeah. yeah sorry. No problem. <laughs> I, I'm not entirely sure how to stop them. That's my problem here, but... Um... I'll leave that to the, the tech team, actually, Lorcan. Are, are they are they bothering you, Elodie? No, it's just surprising me. But um, if, if it's not a bother to you, uh, I will. Not at all, no. It's, it's, That's the uh, thing with to, recording lectures and things like that. You need to have closed captions for um, for, for students. No, it's great. Um, yes, apologies. Uh, I, can't, I can't seem to know how to, to, to remove them. Leave them rolling. It's fine, honestly. Okay. You have them on anyway. Yes. So yeah. So that's the, the same starting point uh, as as Mathieu, which is showing you the evolution of uh, the um, previous election. So that's the twenty twenty two parliamentary elections and the twenty twenty four EP elections and the state of, of the party. So there's no point elaborating further on this because um, Mathieu has ha, has done this, but this. Uh, shows that indeed, as Mathieu was saying, Macron sort of gambled on the divisions of the right and that hasn't quite worked uh, as uh, well as he, as he expected. So um, Macron's party, which is now called Renaissance after having been called En Marche and then La République En Marche. Uh, now it's called Renaissance, but it's mostly now in coalition uh, with a few other parties and they're called Ensemble, Together. Together for the Republic seems to be the new name. It keeps changing all the time. It's driving me nuts a little bit. Uh, 
uh, but in 2022, they had a, a narrow majority of the seats uh, in, in Parliament. And, but, you know, there was still quite difficult sometimes to pass legislation. They uh, quite regularly had to use uh, Article 49.3 of the Constitution, which allows a bill to be passed without a vote if uh, Parliament fails to pass a, a motion against the government. Um, and that created a lot of tensions because they really failed to try. They, they could not often find ways to enlarge, increase the size of, of their majority and get legislation through. So that was uh, also a source uh, of, of frustration for that majority. But obviously, the hope for Macron was to increase their, the size of, of their majority, which they've really not done. They've lost uh, a lot of seats, as you can see here. You can see the United Left uh, previously was called the New Union, oh sorry, I can't remember do the, the mental translation right now, but it was the popular and ecologic union of the left. Now they call the new popular front. Uh, and they also they saw an increase in the number of seats, and also the national rally uh increased its seats. The fourth block in, in, in French politics is the sort of mainstream right. Yeah. Uh the mainstream right has really suffered in this particular election because uh the Party leader, Eric Ciotti, who was at the right of the party, decided to join forces with the national rally. And the rest of the party, or most of the rest of the party, refused that alliance, which led to some absurd situations when we had the party leader locking himself in his office, the rest of the party trying to remove him from his position, but actually the statutes do not allow them to do this. But so the, the Les Républicains are now divided between a small group led by Eric Ciotti, who have a few seats in Parliament, uh, thanks to an agreement with the National Rally, uh, and the rest of uh, Les Républicains uh, have 46 seats. And they're very much squeezed in a small space between the National Rally and uh, Macron's party. So this is what the uh, new assembly looks like. And so what you see here is that everything between the dark red and the dark green is that new popular front. Uh, the uh, Macron Alliance as the sort of gold yellow to the sort of first shades of lightish blue. The darkest blue is uh, Les Républicains, so that's sort of post-colist right. And the gray and black are the National Rally and those on the right who are aligned with um, uh, the National Rally. And so this looks like this, and it's we're very much in a sort of three block situation right now. And so if you I've added as well comparisons with 2017, so you can see how much that Macronist block has shrunk. Uh, they've nearly lost half of their seats. Um, and you could see as well how on the left, that uh, coalition strategy that Mathieu was talking about earlier has worked very well for them because in 2017, there were really a small group of MPs that increased in 2022 when they formed an electoral coalition. And when they renewed that electoral coalition this year, that worked uh, well as well. You can also see how much the national rally has grown in parliament between 2017 uh, and uh, 2024. That's what the parliament looks like now. And this three block make it very, very difficult to consider how um, we're going to make a, a coalition. Um, so who governs? Right now, uh, it's still Gabriel Attal, who looks like he's aged quite a lot in the six months he's been uh, prime minister. But um, so as soon as uh, the elections results were known after the second round, he presented his government's resignation to uh, the president who initially refused it so that they kept going. But uh, this week, last week, sorry, uh, Parliament returned 
and then the prime uh, the president uh, accepted the government's uh, resignation but they still stay in place because there's no alternative yet so it's a situation that's very unfamiliar to the French but it's very familiar to any parliamentary democracy that is used to coalition government well it might take a bit of time between the election and the moment when the parties in parliament manage to find a, a governing agreement so we have a sort of caretaker government that can just keep things running they can't make any new decision they can't introduce bills in, in into parliament etc they keep things ticking along until there's actually a, a government uh it looks like uh macron is uh, arguing that no new government should be uh, appointed until after the uh olympic games uh if i've got my calendar right they run until sometime mid august I apologize, I haven't been paying that much attention to the Olympics. Yeah. But what I do know is that there are also Paralympic Games after that. So is that taking us to no new government until mid-August yeah. um, mid or until actually early September? Uh, that remains to be seen because it's not clear what the, the president wants here. But some new government needs to happen. So there's been a lot of talk of having a left-wing minority government. And as you can see, that's that block that goes from that dark red color to that light pink color that includes so, a, a few communists. Uh, the uh, LFE is uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon's radical left party, and pink is the Socialist Party, and green is uh, Europe Ecologie des Verts, so the Green Party. There are also a few unaffiliated uh, left-wingers in there who have since joined some of the, uh, the parliamentary groups in here. But all together, they make up about, I was looking earlier, that's 223 uh, members of parliament. And, well, that's still 66 short uh, of, a, uh, of a majority in parliament. And that's it's unlikely that there's enough potential um, available votes, even on a bill by bill basis in the rest of parliament to really sustain such a, um, su such a, a coalition. And there's also an issue right now, is, which is that since the um, election, the uh, left-wing parties have been talking a lot to each other to discuss who might be their candidate as, uh, for prime minister. A whole number of names have been proposed and variously rejected by other members of that coalition. Typically, whoever um, LFE suggests end up being rejected by the socialists, whoever the socialists uh, propose ends up being re rejected uh, by uh, LFE. So that's one big issue right now is who might they uh, agree to present as, as a candidate. The other issue is, should they come to having a candidate and should the president appoint this person uh, as prime minister? It's quite unclear how they would get their legislative agenda in place. A second one, so one majority that has, one well, coalition that has a majority and that is very much favored by uh, Macron and others, might be one that includes pretty much all the parties that you can see are linked here together, perhaps with the exception of the Greens. Uh, the uh, Home Secretary really does not like the Greens uh, and uh, would not like them to be in coalition with uh, Renaissance, but that would include the Socialists, some of the moderate uh, on the left, uh, but also then uh, go all the way to Les Républicains. There are a few issues with this potential coalition. One, there's no real evidence at this stage that the socialists have any intention of breaking away from that left-wing coalition. To a degree, this coalition, I mean, to this coalition would really make um, ensemble the core of that coalition. 
and therefore they would be that would be the largest group and would really be in the driver's seat of any such coalition. It's hard to see why the Socialist Party, who Macron has done his best over the last seven years to undermine, maybe make that eight years at least to, to undermine, why they would want to save his skin right now. Another hurdle in this uh, big coalition here is that Les Républicains have said, we don't want to be part of a coalition, we could be part of a legislative agreement of sort of confidence and supply to a minority government where we would have an agreement, we would not be part of that government. Another risk of such a coalition is that it's pretty much everyone but the extremes, and in particular, everyone but the national rally. And that would really play the hand into the hand of Marine Le Pen and Jordan Bardella, who've been arguing that for decades that there's a sort of cartel against the national uh, rally and before that, the national front. And the, that Republican front is for them some evidence of, of, of this cartel, even though it's actually citizens voting against the national rally. Uh, but that would really, that sort of coalition would kind of really strengthen the uh, hand of the national rally or their argument that they're the only real opposition. And we see them saying this already because this week there have been um, internal elections in parliament for uh, the, the speaker, uh, the bureau of the, uh, of the assembly, etc. And unlike in 2022, they did not get any vice presidency, uh, etc. And so they're arguing that, look, everyone else is voting against us again. We are the only uh, opposition. So what does that mean for our institutions? Th th those institutions have been built for majority governments, really. The idea that, you know, you've got a president who's elected by, with, uh, by citizens, and then they will have support from a parliamentary majority and that implement their program. We've had instances where this has not worked out as planned. We call that coalition, where we, Mitterrand had two right-wing prime ministers and Chirac had one uh, socialist prime minister. But in every instance, the government had the support of a parliamentary majority. Since 2022, we've had minority governments and the logics of partisanship, well, that we've been very strong in France, mean that they've really struggled to get to find broader agreements, even on a bill by bill basis, uh, to build majorities. And therefore, they've had to uh, use that uh, Article 49.3 that I was saying about that allows uh, a bill to pass without uh, a vote unless Parliament uh, votes the government out. And those institutions influence parliamentary uh, politicians' behaviour as well. And that creates a really a lack. There's no culture of consensus in French politics. Mm -hmm. And we see that in some of those discussions uh, on the left, for instance, who say, well, we're going to form a government and we will implement our programme. Just our programme and nothing but our programme. But there's no parliamentary majority for that programme. And so it, it's, it's, and then you see as well the uh, right saying, well, we all will support you on a one-to-one -one basis, but it depends because they're also thinking of 2027 and the presidential election. And then you need to maintain your separate identities uh, to have uh, your, your own candidate. So what it means, all this means that it's going to be very difficult. And it is quite possible that Matthew and me and some of us, uh, some of you perhaps uh, in the audience will be voting against in a parliamentary election in a year's time. There, there cannot be a new election for a year after uh, the snap election, but uh, they could well be won after June of 2025. Thank you.